In the last couple of weeks, I've gotten a couple of emails from people, and there were even, I think, a message and a comment under one of the uh, YouTube videos we did uh, asking about the uh, ivory collection, because in the background of most of my weekly videos, you can see a few ivory figures standing there. And as many of you know, I have an interest in carvings. I love Chinese carvings, whether they're in wood or, or um, a stone or uh, ivory or turquoise, I mean, uh, 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 tortoise shell or rhino horns, whatever. And uh, so I thought what I'd do is I pulled out a few examples of things that are around the house here uh, to share with you. And we're going to go through them and, and talk about them a little bit and a little bit about the history of ivory carving in China, which is a long one. It goes back to the 5th century BC. They've been carving ivory there for over seven centuries. I mean, 7,000 years rather, not seven centuries. And uh, it's an interesting one. The first ivory carvings were found in tombs uh, where they found little plaques and ornaments and so forth that were buried with the dead. And then in the Shang Dynasty, they became archaistic looking. They were very, very detailed. And they, they have exhumed from tombs cups and uh, other accoutrements that they would have buried uh, for the afterlife. And that tradition continued on for a very long time. And, and by the Tang Dynasty, uh, the carvings had, had become much more elaborate. Uh, they were carving lots of rhino horns. Um, rhino horn cups were given out as a treasured present to students who passed the, uh, the big exams. And uh, this, they were the, the most prized possession uh, during the rest of their life because they were um, uh, given to them by the emperor directly, who gave the exam himself in many cases. So it's it's a very interesting uh, history. And uh, here we have some examples uh, that are mostly from the uh, late 18th to the early, uh, to the late, late 18th to the late 19th century, I guess, or mid 19th century, and a couple of Japanese examples, some uh, Meiji period uh, pieces. And then of course there's this, the elephant in the room, as they say, is this giant rhinoceros horn cup, which I'll get into some detail on because it's quite an extraordinary example. And maybe one of the one of the best there is in the world. It was carved at the Imperial Palace in the Atelier of Qinlung. Uh, so anyway, we're going to get over here and we're going to start with this uh, little ivory um, snuff bottle. It's not actually a little bottle. It's a pretty big bottle. It's a magnum. And um, I would call it, that's what I would call it, a magnum. It has a cover, which is over there. And uh, this is it. And it's a very interesting scene. It depicts a, a group of gentlemen outside of a house in a courtyard playing musical instruments and uh, in front of this very magnificent building. And you'll notice at the top, there are some trees and there's a, a pine tree, a, a prunus blossom tree and a bamboo tree. And those are the three known in China as the three friends of winter. And uh, here is um, the, the other side of it with the figures, the same, uh, same sort of scene as the other side, but instead of playing instruments, they're dancing and they're playing around. And you'll notice at the bottom, it has this area of little lappets going around the base, just like you see on Chinese porcelains, because a lot of the designs and patterns that you would see on porcelain decoration were also adopted into ivory carving. And this particular one was probably made during the first half of the 19th century, uh, maybe around 1800 to 1820 somewhere in there, but it's in beautiful condition. It's very heavy. It's, it's incredibly heavy for its size. You pick it up and you're surprised at how much it weighs, but it's well hollowed out inside. You, get, you can't really look down in there, but uh, we, we've stuck uh, sticks in there to see how well carved out it is. And it is carved out, but it's just a, a really, really nice example. And then next to it up here are these little chess figures. And uh, Chinese uh, uh, carvers often made uh, chess figures uh, to go with chess sets that they would export in the 19th century, the late 18th and early 19th century. And this is one. This is a knight. All right, and over here we have a pawn in the foreground looking up. And uh, I've had these for a long time. I, I forget where they came from. But occasionally at auction, um, until they started the ban on ivory, these would turn up, uh, complete sets would turn up in auctions and were highly sought after because they're fairly rare, especially if you can find one in, find them in, uh, in good condition where the pieces aren't all broken or replaced with, um, um, you know, uh, uh, w later wood copies and so forth, uh, which was often done. But these are v very, very nice very interesting to look at and uh, how the how the Chinese worked them and they made entire sets of these and then of course an ivory board ivory and ivory and ebony boards and then next to them are a pair of snuff bottles a pair a Chinese man and a woman uh, in the in, in this case they pigmented they painted the ivory after they carved it to add some color to their clothing and their textile you know textile patterns and so forth and the heads pop off there they are inside there's a snuff bottle 
And uh, these are fairly unusual. You, you occasionally come across them, but not often. And uh, these are, are just are sort of happy little uh, bottles. They're probably made during the middle of the 19th century, or 1850 to 1870. And occasionally you'll come across them in uh, group shops, antique shops, and so forth. And if you do, um, and they're selling them, uh, you might want to buy them. Um, it's not legal to sell ivory anymore, but it seems to me an awful lot of places still do. <laughs> Uh, despite the law, um, which was passed uh, a number of years ago, uh, erroneously in my opinion, uh, because it, it is just no, uh, uh, there's just there's no connection in my opinion between um, elephant ivory, uh, of, of old elephant ivory and contemporary ivory. Now, let's see if we can get that to focus. There we go. And then we have this, the uh, card cases. Now, one of these card cases I showed in another video that I was doing carvings in general, but I have a number of them. And uh, this this is one of them. Um, I don't know if this is the one that I showed before, but it's beautifully done, done in Canton. And there were a number of good shops in Canton. One of them has their original box. You may remember we, we talked about that. And this is the uh, Chongsheng um, Workshop. Um, this was one that was actually mentioned in uh, Carl Crossman's book, The China Trade, because it was they'd only seen one one box with this cover with this label. There was a shop next door to it, which was, was much more famous. And um, I happened to come across that one, and I noticed it in Crossman's book. And I said, "I'll hang on to that." All right. And this is the other case. This is this one goes in that case we just looked at. Very very fine. But then this one is even perhaps a little bit even finer. Very detailed, lovely figural scene, and meticulously carved, and in very, very fine condition. Um, it's been well kept over the years, and these were these were a, a sort of luxury items that someone would carry with them um, as a status symbol to have an ivory uh, fully carved uh, case. By the around the mid 19th century, um, the carving quality fell off a bit and wasn't quite up to this standard anymore, and they tended to leave more areas uncarved and so forth and maybe just put a monogram on it. But this one was uh, like the other, like the, the both of them, are just um, fully carved, fully, fully carved, and probably done between 1810 and 1830, somewhere in that time period. Very, very uh, uh, desirable pieces. And these used to be, you know, very popular sellers until the band came in. You put one of these on eBay today, you're going to get a nasty note from them and and have to they'll, they'll pull it down on you um but when these were selling they would they would sell pretty well they would sell for between six and eight hundred dollars a piece routinely um and this some of these these two are particularly fine they might sell for a bit more than that but today they have no market value as they say and uh here is a an interesting example of, from the same period is a um uh, i'll put this down so you can see it it's a cane handle, all right, or a walking stick handle. And what they did was they someone added a sterling silver magnifying glass to it. And this came out of an old uh, China trade family collection in uh, Marblehead um, tied to the crown and shields, who were m among the, uh, the big China traders that you probably read about if you follow it. And uh, it is also superbly carved. It's equally as well carved and more deeply carved than the two card cases we just looked at. And again, with beautiful figural scenes on them, um, uh, you know, sort of just piled up one on top of the other, climbing up it and animals and all kinds of things. And here you have a, 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 um, a, a terrace scene with the, with the Chinese roof and then uh, immortals and figures going up it and so forth. And it's just a really nice example. Very, very finely worked. And, uh, and then you come over to this. This is a brush pot. And uh, the Chinese made lots of brush pots out of ivory, from, from big brush pots to little brush pots, depending on the size and the segment of ivory that they had to work with. Uh, this one was obviously a small one. I bought this many, many years ago at an auction. And um, you notice that it's fully reticulated right through with figures in the foreground amongst bamboo trees and so forth. And there's a poem on this side going down it, and a poem on this side going down it. And, the, and then both sides are, are figures. Here you have a, uh, some ladies with children, um, again, underneath trees, fully reticulated, as I said before. The only thing missing from it is that it's missing its base, um, which often happens with these. You sometimes will find these tubes, and people will say, what are they for? And then, Well, it was a brush pot. And somehow, with the expansion and contraction of the ivory over the years, the bases become loose, and they just fall off. 
Um, it could be fixed. I, I didn't. I never bothered just because I like it just the way it is. Warts and all. Warts and all. <laughs> all right. And uh, and then you may remember um, this box. Um, we talked about this in the last video because it was a, a very interesting uh, carving. Um, and it was very, very similar to a sandalwood box I have that I had gotten from the Harishoff family um, when they had a they had a yard sale at their house in Marblehead. He was a famous yacht designer. And um, let's see here. Here's the top of it. All right. It's beautifully done. And again, the same quality as the card case and the walking uh, the walking stick handle. Um, meticulously carved with a little monogram in the middle. And this had come from a China trade family here in Gloucester. Um, they descended from Salem, Massachusetts, and uh, they were looking to sell it. And... Uh, Oops, here we go. And they decided to sell it, and uh, I said I'd love to buy it, and I did. And uh, there it is. It doesn't have the uh, 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 key, unfortunately. I couldn't find the key for it. They didn't know where it went. But otherwise, it's a really lovely example. And it's, it's, it doesn't have any cracks in it. And if you uh, uh, flip it around this way and look underneath, it's in pretty good shape all around. It is an old, it looks like an old start of a split maybe in the bottom, but that's about as far as it went. And, the, and ivory sheets are very prone to splitting. They would steam them to flatten them uh, so they could carve them like wooden, like boards almost, because uh, this is not a natural shape for ivory. So it took a bit of work to flatten them out. All right. And then uh, moseying along over to this fellow. This is one that was given to me. Um, I had done some estate work for a family up here. And uh, we did a, a whole lot of work for them. And uh, they, they were cleaning out their mother's estate and they had some ivory. And they had several pieces of ivory. And uh, I said, well, I, we, they can't do anything with that anymore because it's illegal. And uh, they put it aside. And then when we got done after days and days and days of going through things and looking at paintings and furniture and whatnot, they said, would you like to have it? And I said, have what? And they said, would you like to have that ivory carving? <laughs> and I said, well, I'd love to have it, but I, 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 can't, I can't sell it. You know, I can't do anything. And they said, no, we want to give it to you as a gift. So they did. And this is it. And it was made during the 19th century, probably mid-19th century. It's beautifully carved, beautifully finished, wonderful polish on it. Very, I loved his face, and I loved the, the looks on the kids' faces. They're just adoring this, this whole scene. And they look like they're washing his feet, actually, if you look at it carefully. And um, he's standing here uh, beaming, and uh, here's the back of it. It's got some really nice ink work on the hat and with a root, a tree coming out of the top of his head, which is interesting. And uh, the robes are just flowing. Um, they look they look almost like they're liquid. Uh, they, they flow so beautifully and they're beautifully polished. There's no mistakes in the carving. Um, and, the, and the folds of the fabric are just excellent all the way down. And this is a fairly heavy piece as well. And it measures about nine inches tall, roughly. And uh, I've, I've got that, and that's, that stands behind me when I'm doing the videos each week. You'll often see it in the background, and uh, I just like it a, a whole lot, really, really do. And then popping over, oh, the last thing of, among the ivory pieces um, is this. Uh, this is, a, I'm going to have to lay this out here. Hold on. There we go. This is a, a, a late 18th, early 19th century ivory armorial uh, decorated fan. And we see lots of fans. You see lots and lots and lots of them. And you see lots of ivory ones, but you don't see many that have memorial crests on them. And this one does, and the crest is in very, very good shape. I've never bothered to look it up because I just like the decoration so much um, as it is. Um, someday maybe I'll look it up. Who knows? But uh, it's a very, very fine example, and it's in excellent condition. Um, the only thing that's ever been done is they had to replace the silks at one point that, w that hold the thing together, which is common. Um, they often fall apart over time and uh, um, need to be replaced, which is not a problem. It's perfectly fine. And then when you come over here, you have a couple of nice little Japanese pieces. These are all Meiji period. Um, this little uh, uh, Netsuki in the, in the foreground here, this little fellow riding on his uh, split bamboo. It's a piece of, it's a section of bamboo that's been split. And if you look under it, you see this little demon. And the little demon is there to protect the child. Okay, it's a protection thing. Now it keeps him safe because he will scare off anybody who might come to harm him. So he's always there out of view, but ready to help. 
and um, here you have this wonderful face, and this has been painted also. The Japanese often painted um, their uh, uh, ivory carvings like this, and this was a great example, and um, I, this came out of a, a, a collection down in uh, Salem, Massachusetts. As a matter of fact, uh, the woman we, we did a whole bunch of work for, and uh, this was she she had gotten into um, gathering Netskis that had accumulated in her own family at one point, and she had this one, and uh, we bought and I sold the whole collection, but I kept this one as a keepsake. It's a wonderful thing about being a dealer is that is that from time to time, you uh, uh, buy a collection, and you have that great opportunity to pick a couple of pieces to hang on to for yourself to keep your interest, and that's what that is. And I've had I've had that for many many years, and then this, uh, a little okimono of a of a Japanese gentleman um, with a basket, and so forth. This is nicely carved. It's not signed, which surprises me because the workmanship is really really fine on it, and it was done during the Meiji Restoration era. There's the back of it, and again it's been paint decorated, and he's on this nifty root bench. And um, he looks like he's a basket maker, and as you can see, they come apart. Okay, they they're made to come apart, so you can you can you can pack them and ship them. And um, this is this is a, a good example right here. Let's uh, see if we can. Well, I will put it back together later. Nobody wants to watch me wrestle with that. And uh, then over here is another one of a flower seller, and he's got his flowers um, um, on a, on a carrier um, with 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 baskets on each side, and he's standing here. Um, it's got a wonderful facial expression. Let me just turn this a little bit. Whoops. Excuse me. There we go. Uh, there's There he is. And uh, he's sort of going along. He's got his flowers and he's crossing. It looks like he's crossing a stream uh, or lo loading something onto a dock from this basket up here in this rocky area in, with uh, grass, uh, woven grasses around it uh, and so forth. It's very, very nice. And then coming over to this, this is the piece from India. And uh, this is an interesting story. This, this came from a, a, a Boston family. And it had a note inside of it when I got it. And it was a gift to this family in 1815. I was shocked they wanted to sell it. Um, it's a tortoiseshell box with a reticulated top. And um, according to them, this was made in India. And it's very finely, it's gilded, gilded tortoiseshell and then pen worked with a picture of a man and a woman hunting. And this was given to the family in Boston. They were visiting India by the wife of the governor of India, the British, then the then British governor uh, gave this to them. They were staying with them and gave it to them as a parting gift. And it's an absolutely great little box. It has a lot of the details are almost mind boggling in here for the amount of work that's in here. It's just incredibly carved with all these sort of Rococo devices underneath an arch of trees, and they're riding through the woods and so forth. And I'm assuming this was taken from a print source. I'm assuming the Indian, um, the, the carvers in India that did this were doing it from a, from a print source of some kind, but um, very beautiful. And I thought it was English when I first saw it, and they, they swear up and down that it came down through the family and it came from India, and it wasn't brought there from uh, England. All right, and then the last piece in this pile is this, the rhinoceros horn cup. And this has a very interesting background. Um, a Boston family, again, another Boston family. We deal a lot with Boston families. Um, their great, the great, uh, great grandfather uh, was a very successful merchant and he owned factories in China during the late 19th and early 20th century. And he went over there and he bought a lot of Chinese art, some great Chinese art, um, including a, bam, uh, a rhinoceros horn um, uh, carving marked Wan Li um, of, the, of the seated Buddha. It was very similar to the one that sold at Christie's for oh, 10 or 15 years ago for about 650000 It was a virtual twin to it, virtual twin. And uh, this was also in the same cabinet in the house. And it is a uh, 18th century uh, rhino horn. You'll notice, of course, that there is a poem, an inscription on it in the upper right, which is extremely unusual, with a seal mark. And then there is a signature on this side, right there, of the artist. We don't know who the artist is, uh, but uh, just an amazing thing. And judging by the quality of this and, and the, the detail, and all, everything that's going on here, this was most likely carved at the atelier in at the emperor's uh, palace, at the, in, in, in Chenlong's palace, in Beijing. They did have a studio there where they carved rhino horns because he was fascinated by them, 
and uh, he he kept uh, records of his of his rhino horn collection. He personally cataloged them as he did other objects in his collection, including bronzes. And and here's a, a scene at the other end, and the uh, carvers would make these for him. And this is the style of this is slightly different than the Ming examples. It's more detailed, has a, a, a longer base to it, and so forth. And then the back of it. This is the part that I really love. There are people inside the back of it, tucked in there very gently um, beneath this. And then the real big surprise comes when you look into the top. Now, often on the tops of these, you will see um, a chimera or two. This has a whole like little army of them. There's about 15 of them in here. And uh, they're climbing up out of the out of the inside of the cup. And uh, they're beautifully detailed. I'll see if the camera can focus on it. Um, there you go. You can see the detail of those chimeras. Just absolutely amazing. All the way back over to the pine tree. And then down along the edge. And then you have the clouds and low relief carving around it and so forth. There's a little bump in the upper right hand corner there. I don't, I don't know where that, that's an old bump. It's turned black. So I don't know when that happened. But um, this is the piece. It's a really fine, fine, fine cup. And um, this I, actually belongs to a family that I've been holding it now in my safe for the last, uh, I don't know, five years. They keep saying they're coming to get it, um, and, and they never do, so I just keep it in the safe. But I thought for this it would be fun to pull it out. Uh, I like to look at it once in a while. It's a, a beautiful object. And uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, if you were in China um, between the 1880s and 90s and the 1920s and 30s, and you had some wherewithal, um, we've all seen these legendary sales and collections from back then, uh, exhibits that were done the back in the day, the forerunners almost, the forerunners almost of C.T. Liu and company, um, when amazing things were floating around in the Chinese market and were, were available um, for a price. And this is the kind of thing that you could buy. And this same collection had also some very fine Kang Shi examples, um, Ming iron, uh, Fu lions that were about two or three feet tall, um, all kinds of terrific things, and some great Persian rugs. Uh, early, early 19th century and late 18th century Persian rugs in this collection, along with Singer Sergeant paintings and other stuff too. But um, this was just uh, one of the pieces. And um, we had appraised this uh, about eight or nine years ago, 10 years ago, for about $700,000, $750,000. And um, I, I, at the time, I remember saying to them, if you, you, you want to sell this, you should probably sell it now because the laws are going to change and this may become, become unsellable anywhere in the world legally. And um, they, they hesitated a bit for too long and it's no longer sellable. Um, this, this cannot really be sold without an awful lot of um, haranguing and headaches and, and documentation and CITES permits and everything else. So they're going to be keeping it. At some point, they'll, they'll come and collect it. And it's here waiting for them whenever they're ready. All right. So that's it. The, that, that's a little bit on ivory carving and rhino carvings and Meiji period and Qing period and all that. But the ivory, uh, the history of ivory carving is a fascinating one. Uh, it really is. Uh, and not a lot is talked about it anymore because it's politically incorrect and all that silliness. Uh, but it's a true art form. Um, and uh, as you can see, um, the, the Chinese really, really excelled at it, um, maybe more so than any other culture in the world. Um, the Japanese were very good, uh, but my, my preferences are still for the very fine Chinese pieces, as good as the Japanese material is. And the Japanese material is, of course, worthy of collecting as well. Absolutely. Um, but it's, it's, it's of a bygone era. And, uh, um, you know, if you have some, hang on to it, be good to it. Keep it in the humid place in the winter so your central heating system doesn't crack everything. And uh, enjoy it. All right? All right. That's about it. Have a great day, and I'll be back tomorrow with a regular video. Bye-bye.